Finance Seminar at the University of Warwick. It's really a great pleasure to be here and especially to give this talk on forward rank dependent performance criteria because of course Warwick uh, has a very strong group and a lot of, of uh, very good research on the theory of uh, forward performances is coming out of Warwick, right? Uh, uh, in part thanks to you, but also uh, initially through through um, uh, Henderson and Hobson, and, and recently also some very nice research on probability distortions. So uh, I think it's a it's a great pleasure to be here, and and hopefully people will find this topic interesting. Uh, so this work I'm going to present today is jointly with Xue uh, Donghe, who is uh, from the Chinese University of Hong Kong and who was my postdoctoral advisor while I was a postdoc at, at CUHK, and also with Talia Srifopla from the University of Texas at Austin and also the University of Oxford. So in this topic, we really kind of uh, combine two streams in the literature. So on the one hand, we have forward performance criteria, and on the other hand, we have rank dependent utility. And so to modify this and, and kind of to talk about why it might be interesting to look at it combined, I first want to uh, introduce them individually. So I first going to uh, introduce and motivate just formal performances as a framework and rank dependent utility, and then talk a little bit of about why it might be interesting to, to combine these two frameworks and, and study uh, this combination. So I start with the forward. Uh, performances and I always like to motivate them by taking one step back and first recall what we actually do when we do classical or, or backward expected utility maximization. So in, in classical expected utility, basically if, if you want to apply this, this framework, you need to specify three ingredients. So you, you start with a time horizon here, capital T, and then you need to specify a utility function. Uh, which applies at the end of the time horizon. So the utility function will map your terminal wealth to the utility you derive from the terminal wealth. And then you specify a model for the financial market. And all those ingredients have to be specified at the initial time before you start um, solving this problem. And then basically you solve uh, a stochastic optimization problem. And, and here you have dynamic programming principle, you have time consistency, of optimal policies. And there's kind of an intuitively pleasing interpretation of the value function of this problem as also an in intermediate indirect utility. Okay, so uh, this framework, of course, has, has its merits and, and there are many useful applications of it, but there are also some drawbacks, right? And in particular, one can ask oneself, uh, what actually happens at the terminal time t? Right? So if in this problem, basically you look at optimal investment as a closed system. You start at zero, you end at T, and then it's not so clear what you do there, right? Do you consume everything or do you reinvest partly? So this is this is basically ignored in, in this setting. The second potential problem is that you need to specify the preferences which apply in the future at the term at, at the initial time. And so if if maybe you, you think about capital T, the time you want to retire, then potentially this is this is still far away and you would actually need to know what say how how for example one million would translate to uh, to a utility you gain from one million in say 30 years from now or how two million would would translate to a utility 30 years from now and so on and that might not be easy to do and third you also have to specify a model for the entire time horizon Right. And in, in particular, again, if the time horizon is large, that might not be easy to do, and you, you don't have the option uh, to, to update this model later on. Okay, so kind of with this in mind, this, these forward performances have been introduced, and they uh, kind of uh, turn the game around a bit. So under the forward, forward criteria, the investor starts with specifying her preferences for today for the initial time. And so here the idea is that this is much easier, right? You know basically hmm, what what uh, a certain wealth level today, what sort of utility you could derive from this wealth level today, not at a potentially far away uh, future time. And then afterwards you update these preferences endogenously and you do this under the guidance of the Martingale optimality principle. Martingale optimality principle in the backward framework is a, a corollary basically to the existence of an optimal strategy. Here we impose it as, as really a guiding 
principle and as a definition of, of those preferences. And I think this will become clear later when, when we uh, see the math behind it. And so this basically imposes dynamic programming forward instead of backwards in time. And so this this uh, has is a very nice uh, framework which which can uh, adapt to changing market conditions and also accommodate dynamically changing horizons. It has been uh, well studied. So this, of course, is only a, a partial list. These criteria have been introduced in in a series of paper by Mark Musiela and Talia Sarifopoulou, and also a, a very a very um, related notion of of horizon unbiased utility is 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 coming out of work by by Henderson and Hobson. And then there's a, a lot of further studies on this, in particular, also Gertrude has a, a lot of nice work on, on this framework. Um, yeah, so here kind of the, the upper list I'm, I'm presenting here. This is really the classical investment problem in continuous time. And more recently, this idea or the setting has been extended also to other financial problems or other settings. And in particular, there is now this new notion of uh, discrete time, predictable forward uh, utility or forward processes, which has been introduced by Angus Stari, Sarfoplo and Cho. And I also have a, a recent paper on this, and it has been applied to problems in insurance, to setting where there is model ambiguity, optimal contract theory. And so this talk I'm giving today kind of belongs to this second stream, basically, where we use the idea of the original formulation, but we want to apply it to a different set of preferences rather than just the, the very classical utility preferences. And the, the preference we want to study is this rank dependent utility. So rank dependent utility is a theory which was uh, developed by, by John Quiggin in, in the 80s. And it really has become, I think, one of the most alternative series of choice on the risk when compared with the expected utility paradigm. So in this theory, basically, you have two components. On the one hand, you have a concave utility function. This is just exactly the same as in, in the classical expected utility. And then there is also a probability distortion function. So the, the distortion function uh, basically maps the cumulative distribution and distorts it. And often this is done uh, such that extreme events happening with small probability are overweighted. That is the most common psychological finding which motivates the introduction of, of this distortion function. Again, if you're not familiar with it, it becomes clear when, when you see the math uh, behind this later. Now, this is a, a behavioral theory, and it has been very successful in, a, in, in explaining a number of empirical phenomena, which are, which are kind of hard to reconcile from an expected utility perspective. So one is the ally paradox, right? The, uh, basically a contradiction to the axiom of in, in independence. Uh, it can also uh, explain the simultaneous investment of, of well-diversified funds and, and, uh, and, and single stocks. So if you already have a well-diversified portfolio, say you invest in a couple of ETFs, why would you simultaneously have some single stocks, right? From expect utility, that, that doesn't look optimal, but, but uh, this can be explained by, by this theory. And it also can explain preference for skewness. So these, these are kind of well um, documented empirical phenomena, and they can be explained by rank dependent utility. So rank dependent utility it has been introduced in the 80s, but only quite recently, about 10 years ago, people really started um, looking at optimal investment and in, under rank dependent utility. And I think the reason is that this is a hard problem and there's two sources of difficulty. So the one, one sort of difficulty is time and consistency. So these are, you don't have a time consistent problem because you don't have a linear expectation. You have a Schoke integral mathematically. So you don't have a linear expectation. You don't have a tower property. Okay, so that's one sort of difficulty. The other sort of difficulty is you also don't have concavity. And so even though the utility function is concave, the probability distortion leads to a non-concave objective function. So these two uh, challenges together have, have made this problem to study. And basically the breakthrough, I think, was really this idea of a, a quanti what is called a quantile approach. 
So this has been developed uh, in, I think this is the earliest paper where, where this appears, where they study uh, cumulative prospect theory, optimal investment on cumulative prospect theory, and then has been extended in a, in a series of papers. And the idea here is really to change the decision variable from terminal wealth or from optimal strategies to the quantile of the terminal wealth distribution. And then you can regain concavity and, and ultimately solve this problem. And I think the most general solution uh, was obtained in this very nice paper here by, by Xiao and Zhou, um, which is not, not too long ago. And then uh, afterwards, this basically has been quite well studied, um, uh, how optimal investment decisions are made on the rank dependent utility in, in complete markets. Okay, so, and very recently there is this working paper, so this is, I think, is maybe only about uh, two or three months old by Hu Xin and Zhou, where they also look at uh, this, a so-called sophisticated agent. So all these previous papers, they are uh, on pre-committed strategies. Here they look at a, an equilibrium strategy, and this paper is really quite closely related with what I'm going to present today in, in, many, in many ways. So if you if you find this interesting, I really recommend looking at, at at this working paper here as well. Some of the ideas uh, appear there as well. Okay, what to to the best of my knowledge remains open is um, to solve this problem in analytically in incomplete markets. So there are some special cases where you can do it, but in general, I think this is a very difficult problem because in complete market, of course, time consist time inconsistency is not is not a challenge, right? You can basically reduce it to a single period problem and then just replicate terminal payoffs. And then this is not a problem any any longer, right? But in incomplete markets, this becomes uh, hard. And I think this is, to the best of my knowledge, still, still open. Okay, so uh, why do we want to combine it? Basically, we, what we hope to achieve is a, a framework of forward rank dependent performance criteria where then the utility functions and the probability distortions evolve together endogenously and forward in time together also with wealth and, strat and strategies. And so why is this? I mean, of course, there is the mathematical component, but why it is interesting also from an from a economic perspective is that um, basically there is a conceptual challenge of reconciling the time consistent nature of the forward Right, which is driven by the martingale optimality principle by definition, with the typically time inconsistent behavior coming from the probability distortion. And that's also why we call it uh, time consistent investment under under probability distortion, because this is basically what we what we will achieve here. And so this has actually been identified in, in a review article article by, by Nicholas Barberis as one of the uh, remaining open challenges for the psychology on tail events to to study this relationship between distorting probabilities and time inconsistent or consistent behavior. And so we, ho we hope we can contribute also to uh, to this open problem besides just the, the mathematical generalization. Okay, so the, the outline of, of the rest of my talk is as follows. So first we introduce the investment model and then I give you some background results on rank dependent utility. So we'll review how, how an optimal solution looks like on, on the rank dependent utility maximization. Then we make the definition of forward rank dependent performance criteria. And here actually we, we will give you two definitions. One is just kind of mimicking the traditional criteria and another is is uh, motivated by time consistency. And then we will in turn show that the two are actually equivalent. The final or, or in next we will go uh, to the first main, I think main serum there we say, okay, we look at, we have a, a forward rank dependent performance which is given and we want to characterize the, the structure of the probability distortion part of, of this forward rank dependent performance. And uh, this, this characterization of the structure then also leads to a structural insight on how the optimal wealth process looks like, which will then in turn motivate a change of measure. And we introduce a new, a new probability measure, which is called uh, the rank dependent or the distorted probability measure. And then we basically can reduce this problem to 
the problem of the classical forward in a so-called distorted auxiliary market. So market, and then we can build on the existing theory on, on forward performances in this auxiliary market to then later construct uh, the forward rank dependent case. Okay, and then if there's time at the end, I, I uh, also want to bit of, talk a bit about relations with the dynamic utility approach. So this this last kind of section of the paper is uh, looking at the backward problem. So so this has nothing to do with the forward. And, and in the backward problem, there is this recent idea on how to um, approach time inconsistent problem, and it's called the dynamic utility approach. And um, basically, the results we derived motiva motivated us to. Uh, revisit this problem and and maybe we can contribute something here as well. Okay, so here is uh, the model. The model is very standard. So we have uh, one risk-free asset which which does not provide interest, and n risky assets which follow this uh, geometric Brownian motion. So here, um, W is is a is an n-dimensional Brownian motion. And we, we assume that the filtration is also generated by this Brownian motion. So I think this is very standard. We assume that the drift and the volatility uh, is, is deterministic. I will talk about this uh, later, why, why this is important. That's maybe a, a restriction. And these are just um, integrability conditions. And here just some uh, more notation. So we, we will often see this market price of risk process. This we denote by lambda. That is just uh, the inverse of the volatility times the drift. Okay, and then in this uh, market, because uh, the because the number of Brownian motion equals the number of, of assets, it's a complete financial market. And so in particular, we have a unique pricing kernel. So I, I've, I've talked before that I think the, the incomplete case is open even in the backward setting. So also to, to study the forward setting, we limit ourselves to, to a complete market. So here we have, uh, as I said, we have a unique uh, probability measure and a unique equivalent Martingale measure, and we denote the density process or, or the, the pricing kernel process by rho t. And we also introduce this uh, this notation here, rho st. That is basically just the uh, kernel which would correspond to a financial market if you start at time s and you end at time t. So that's uh, the notation we are using here. And then we will also often see their uh, cumulative distribution functions. These are just denoted by F rho T if we go from zero to T and F rho S T if we start from, from small S and, and go to small T. Okay, so this mark is very standard. So basically the, the key assumptions we impose is, is on the one hand, we have a complete market and on the other hand, we have deterministic coefficients. So this, this one might look risk Directive, but uh, I will talk shortly that this is not just made for technical reasons, but also conceptually. I think it would be conceptually difficult to look at a to look at this setting when when um, the drift and volatility are stochastic. So I, I'll explain this later why why this is important here. Okay, and then in this market, um, we we look at trading policies pi. Which, which are assumed to be self-financing, and then in turn, uh, the wealth process just solves this, this uh, SCE here. Okay, and uh, we look at, uh, so these are just notation. I think this is very standard, so I go, let's go through this quickly. We have the set of admissible strategies. They consist of the of progressively measured processes, which are integrable and lead to a wealth process, which is non-negative. And one more notation here: if we if we um, have a, a fixed time t zero, and we look at a fixed admissible uh, strategy or policy pi tilde, then the set here a pi tilde t zero. This is just a set of strategies which are admissible and which up to t zero coincide with pi tilde. And so up to up to t zero, you you have to trade according to Patilla, and then afterwards you can do whatever you want. Okay, so let's let's quickly review rank dependent utility theory. So as I said, there are two ingredients. One is the utility function, one is the probability distortion function. And if you have a, a random prospect X, then the, the value of this prospect is given by this Schoke integral. So you have here uh, the utility 
of, of a point and then uh, here you have the, uh, the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of the prospect, and you distort the cumulative distribution of the prospect. So how to think about this, right? So typically, or the, empirically, if you calibrate this function, then most often you find a structure which looks uh, something inverse S-shaped, something like this, right? Okay, and so here you can think of it as follows. If you have something inverse S-shaped, then what this distribution here is doing Right, there was this distortion here is doing is it overweights the the extreme parts of of the distribution right so if you have very small or very large valves then these these uh, extreme events are overweighted by this factor here and this also to some degree uh, can explain why why rank dependent utility is time inconsistent right so the the example how to illustrate this I, I like best is basically if you think about uh, just a binomial tree or ca casino gambling. So you assume in each step you can either win or lose and you repeat this o o over time. Okay, so then if you look at a scenario that you always win, so you start at, at a given wealth level and then you go up, 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 right? So then you would have basically the best possible outcome, right? So, so at time zero, this happens with a very small probability, right? Basically, with, one half to the power of of the time of say if you have n rounds to the power of n okay and so this is a very small probability and then this is going to be heavily overweighted if you have this this structure here now if you actually are lucky and you move along this path right and then you're at the last time time step then in the last time step you have just a 50 50 chance to go up or down right so the 50 50 chance of course is not going to be overweighted anymore so at the last step, you, you have a very different uh, weighting through this um, weighting function than you would have at, at the initial time. And this basically causes these, these problems to become time inconsistent. Okay, and then here, uh, so you also see, by the way, that if you take the identity, so if, if W is just the identity, then this, of course, just uh, reduces to the expectation of U of X, right? So, so that's quite straightforward to see here. Okay, so, so technically we, we basically assume that the utility functions are, are C2, they're strictly increasing, strictly concave, and satisfy the NADA conditions. And for the probability distortion functions, we only assume that they're continuously differentiable, strictly increasing, and normalized. So of course, uh, you don't distort anything of, of probability zero, or which, which happens with certainty. So here you have this normalization. But otherwise, they can take any shape uh, they want. Okay, and then this this would be the backward uh, problem, the backward portfolio optimization problem on the rank dependent utility. So you, at time zero, now you have to specify the time horizon. You have to specify the dynamics of the market as as we've just introduced, and then you need to choose a utility function u and a distortion function w, and you can solve this problem here. Right, and you solve this backward, and you get a value function. Okay. And uh, in, in this case, because the market is complete, how this is approached is you, you instead of solving over strategy, it's much more convenient to just solve over, over terminal payoffs, which are replicable from, from the initial wealth. And then afterwards, you just uh, replicate the optimal payoff in, in, in a complete market. And as I said, this problem here is, is uh, solved through the quantile approach. So you change it. Uh, you change the decision var variable again to to quantiles of optimal payoffs, and then you can get uh, something uh, which is solvable. And here, basically, is is the solution of of how this looks like, how the optimal solution looks like uh, structurally. So uh, you have so this one is basically just an inverse marginal utility, and then here you have a Lagrange multiplier, okay, and then you have this function n which looks relatively complicated, it depends on, on the um, probability distortion and the quantile of the kernel. And then the hat here is the concave envelope. So this is not necessarily a concave function. So you take basically the smallest concave function dominating it, that's the concave envelope. And then you take the derivative and, and uh, you evaluate it on one minus the distortion of, of the kernel, well, basically of the CDF of the kernel evaluated at kernel. So that's a uh, a uniform distribution here in terms of distribution. Okay, so this is uh, the structure of it. And 
if like historically basically in this in this early 2008 paper they solve this problem under an additional condition and we call this here the the chincho monotonicity uh, condition now this condition is, is is as follows that this uh, fraction here so the quantile of of the quantile of the kernel divided by the marginal probability distortion is non-decreasing. Now, if this is the case, it turns out that this is actually concave and you don't need to take a concave envelope and then this simplifies considerably and you have just uh, the, the formula here. And in particular, you can also see that if, if the distortion is the identity, then this is, is of course one. And then you just have the very classical solution here. This is just uh, the inverse marginal utility uh, evaluated at a Lagrange multiplier times the kernel. Right? So that's that's the uh, very traditional uh, solution. Okay, so now uh, let's review the the definition of the forward. So in now is still without probability distortion. This is the classical definition. So a, a forward performance criterion is an adaptive process such that for any fixed t and any fixed uh, omega, you have a utility function. And then you have for any strategy, for any admissible strategy, the composition between the forward criterion and the valve processes generated by the strategy is a super martingale. So it's decreasing on average. And moreover, there is a strategy such that under this strategy, the, the, the decomposition between the performance and the optimal valve is a martingale. And so this is uh, this is the Martingale optimality principle, basically in in the backward setting, where this just follows from uh, the existence of an optimal strategy. But here is the definition which which we impose on these forward performance criteria. Okay, and so here in this in in this classical setting, one really has this connection between the Martingale optimality principle, uh, time consistency of optimal policies and also dynamic programming. But the question is for rank dependent utility, none of these features exist, right, in the backward, in the classical setting, because you don't have dynamic programming, you, you don't have time consistency, and there is not even a notion of a martingale, right? There is actually not even a, a notion of a conditional expectation on the probability distortion. So here it's not immediately clear how to extend this definition, and, and we address this by basically proposing two distinct definitions. One is just imitating this idea we've seen, and then the other is based on time consistency. And then we will show that they're actually equivalent. So here comes the definition of the forward rank dependent performance. Uh, so this is now a pair of processes. Okay, one will be the utility, the utility part. One is the distortion part. And the distortion part, you know, is actually a field. It's, it's not just indexed by the by the time horizon t, but it's indexed by two times, s and t. And the idea is that this will distort a market that starts at s and ends at t. So it, it distorts the probability in the interval over s and t. And we'll show later that if one would just have this definition without allowing it to depend on the starting time, then the only uh, the only function which satisfies is the identity. So then it completely reduces to to the classical case. Okay, and so of course uh, the utility functions they have to be actual actual utility functions, and these have to be distortion functions. And now we we, we just mimic the same idea. So we say for any admissible strategy, this value. And so here we now we now take here uh, basically the, the the conditional distribution condition on the filtration of S, but we we just have this this weighting here is decreasing on average. So this is the same idea as before. And then there is a strategy where this performance value is preserved. And so, so I don't want to call this a martingale or a super martingale, but I think the idea is, is, uh, is very much the same, that along any strategy, the performance value decreases. Along one of them, it is, it is conserved. OK, and then first, OK, first we want to show that this definition is not a void, right? And it, it reduces to the classical forward if the probability distortion is the identity. And that's exactly the statement of this proposition. So if you have a forward rank dependent performance where the distortion part is just the identity, then if you look at the utility part alone, then this is just a classical forward performance in, in the original sense. 
And conversely, if you start with a classical uh, forward performance, you can always upgrade it to a forward rack dependent performance by simply setting the distortion to be the identity. So, so this in particular also shows that this definition is not empty because in this market, it is uh, uh, well known that there are um, deterministic forward performance criteria. So, let's, so let me go back here a moment and say something about why we assume deterministic coefficients. Of course, if, if you would have random coefficients, then in a classical case, you also need to allow these utility functions and the distortion functions to be adapted processes. Now here, we want them to be deterministic processes. And, and why is that? So if these would be adapted, then UT here is something FT measurable and WST here is something FT measurable. Right, so, but of course, we need to pull it back to compare it with a quantity at time s. So the question is how you would do that, right? Then, of course, the the kind of canonic approach would be, or, or the, the naive approach would be, okay, I just take a conditional expectation. But this is we didn't want to do this because I think this is not really consistent. If you first distort probabilities using this distortion, and then later to pull it back you apply a, a linear um, conditional expectation. So this is why we want those processes to be deterministic. And I think really this is a conceptual issue, not just a technical issue. We, we don't want here to have something random and then needing to pull it back using, using a linear uh, conditional expectation. So now let's have a look at, at the second definition. The second definition is what we call a time consistent rank dependent performance criterion. So time consistent rank dependent performance criterion is again a pair where each U is a utility function. This is a distortion function such that there is a strategy and the strategy is optimal for any initial time and any terminal time. So whenever you start looking at the problem and wherever you end, this will always be the solution to this optimization problem here. Okay. And so this is not enough. What we additionally need is what we call a time consistent rank dependent performance criterion preserving the performance value. And so we additionally want that, well, first we have the first part and then this optimal strategy here also generates the right optimal value. So, so this is not necessarily the case. But if we have that, then we can show the following. Namely that a, a pair of deterministic functions, U and W, or yeah, I mean, a uh, sequence of functions, right? Process of functions uh, is a forward rank dependent performance criterion if and only if it is the time consistent rank dependent performance criterion preserving the performance value. And so in this case, this really connects uh, the original definition with, with time consistency under probability distortion and shows that the two definitions are, are in fact equivalent. OK. So next, I, I come to the first major result. And here, we, we basically give necessary conditions on the distortion part of a forward rank dependent performance criterion under, under the assumption it exists, right? So we just assume, let's, let's have a look at it. We, we, we take one and we want to, we want to characterize the, the distortion part. We don't care the utility part uh, at the moment. We just want to, to classify the distortion part. And here we interestingly find a, a dichotomy basically, and it, the dichotomy looks as follows. So we have either of two cases, either one of the two. And the first case is for any S and T, the distortion has the following representation. It is normalized and then it is basically an integral of the quantile of the kernel over this market raised to a certain power. And this power here is what we call the distortion parameter gamma. In this gamma here, it is independent of S and T. So for any S and so there is a gamma such that for any S and T, W S T is of the following form. And I like to think of this of by by taking the derivative. So if you take the derivative, then basically what this shows is the marginal distortion is a power of the quantile of the kernel. That's that's the, the interpretation you have here. So this is one option. And the second option is that for any S and T, you solve the following inequality. So the, the, the distortion solves this inequality for any P. 
Okay, and this looks a bit curious, but we will see that this corresponds basically to the case where you never want to invest. So if the distortion is kind of so bad that that you would never want to make any investment in, in this market, and then in this case, of course, the optimal strategy is just always zero. It doesn't depend on what the utility is. It is it's just always zero. And then you can take U to be a, a constant, right? a constant utility, and then you have a forward. So we really have only one of those two. And I found this surprising, or I want to emphasize that this is, is, is surprising because we don't restrict the, the, like the family of possible distortion functions is quite large, right? We only have increasing and C1 and normalized. And here we show the only viable class is actually of this particular form. Okay, so I don't, I don't give uh, uh, many proofs in, in this talk due to time constraints, but this proof I liked a lot. So I want to uh, show just the idea. So I just sketched the idea of, of the proof. And so the first step in the, in the proof is basically we want to show that the distortion function is either satisfying the change or monotonicity condition, so that this fraction here is not decreasing, or we are in the later case where the inequality always holds. Okay, and to show this, we first note that the optimal wealth process has to solve this optimization problem, right? At any S and T, it has to solve this optimization problem. This is what we showed by the equivalence to, to time consistency. And then we also know the structure of this because this problem has actually been solved, right? That's what I, what I showed before. So we know this wealth process, the optimal wealth process must be of the form, okay, inverse marginal utility, Lagrangian, and then this uh, concavevication of this function n, which is relatively complicated. Okay, so we know the structure. Okay, and now what time consistency is really saying is that whether from time zero you go to, to time t, or you for, first go to time s, and then from s you go to time t, you should get the same. That, that is the idea of time consistency. So you must have that whether you first go to S and then to T, or you directly go to T, is the same. Okay, and then doing some algebra, basically, when one can uh, get get this following uh, equation here, right? And, and here I just introduce some abbreviations. So I, I call here this part here, I call H1, this I call H2, and this is H3. Okay, now because of the structure of this market, okay, the, the kernels from 0 to S and S and T are independent, and uh, they also have the following kind of multiplicative relationship. So here, uh, I basically deduce the following uh, out of it, but right? I can deduce that I have the following functional equation, which must be satisfied by, by these three functions. Okay, and from this one, I can then argue just just uh, from, from the properties uh, which, which we impose on the utility functions and, and the distortion functions, that either all of them are strictly decreasing at any point, or they're constant. In the constant case, we can translate it back to, to be in the case where we have this, uh, this um, uh, inequality satisfied at any point. If it's strictly decreasing, we can show we have the Chincho monotonicity condition. If we have the monotonicity condition, then these functions simplify. Right? That's basically what, what we've seen before, that then this, this becomes looks much easier here. Okay, and now, uh, basically, we, if we go back to this equation, we just make a trick. We just take once y equal one, once z equal one, and then we plug this in here. Okay, and what we end up with is just a functional equation only for one of them. And so now we, we have a functional equation which is satisfied only by, by one of those three. We, we apply another transform, we basically take the log, right? and then the, the, the log of the product becomes the sum of the logs. And then if we do this transform, then we find that this function, this new function then satisfied what is called Cauchy's functional equation. So this is a very old and, and the well-studied uh, functional equation. And we also know that this is continuous and, and the only uh, continuous solution to this uh, functional equation here are linear functions. Okay, and then from this one, basically, we just translate everything back and, and uh, doing doing the algebra here, one finds this, this very particular form. So I like this because we can make use of this uh, uh, kind of very old, old, old result here, which is really coming out of time consistency. So the time consistency imposes this functional equation. And then one can do something similar for the other two and, and get the results there as well. 
Okay, so now let's look at, at uh, the interpretation of this, or, or better we can say a bit more about this class of distortion functions. So first, in, in this log normal case, one can also rewrite it, right? One can just rewrite that this, this uh, CDF of the kernel is actually not normal, and write it in the following form where here this phi is just a CDF of a standard normal. Okay, and this is interesting because this class of distortion function was studied before in the literature, and it was a uh, uh, proposed by by Sean Wong in, in 20 years ago, uh, he, who he proposed basically a distortion of the following form, right? So it's not exactly the, the same. The difference here is that uh, the, the this displacement term in in the classical sense was just exogenous and and static, and now in in the forward term, this this displacement here depends on the market, and it it's it also depends on time, and it really uh, dynamically uh, depends on time. Okay, but this has been is a very popular class which we discovered here. It's in particular popular in in the insurance literature. Okay. Okay, so here is a result or another corollary we obtain is is what I basically promised before that if uh, I would not allow the distortion part to depend on both initial and terminal time then this class of processes would just reduce to the case where or the only possibility is that I have the identity or to be a bit more precise is if, if I don't depend on the initial time, then either I have the identity or I always have uh, this, this inequality and the inequality just corresponds to no investment. So it's, this is not a very interesting uh, case what is happening here. And we also can interpret this distortion function economically. And for doing so, we go back to comparative rank dependent utility theory, right? So in, in this book, basically by, by John Quiggan, he introduces the notion of pessimism. And this notion is basically motivated as follows. So for if you have a, a rank dependent utility representation V, which consists of a utility uh, function U and distortion W, then, and, and you take a prospect X, then you can define a certain equivalent in exactly the same way as as for the, the the classical utility case, right? So basically, you just take the certain amount which gives you the same uh, preference value as the random amount. Right? So, so this would be given by this here, and you can also define the risk premium in exactly the same manner. You just the risk premium is just the expectation, the difference between expectation and certainty equivalent. Okay, now. What is new here is under a rank dependent utility, you can decompose the risk premium into, into two parts. So one is called the pessimism premium and one is called the outcome premium. And the pessimism premium is just depends on the distortion function alone. So here you basically take the difference between the expected value of a prospect and kind of the distorted uh, expected value here right, of, of the prospect. And the outcome basically then takes into, a, into account the combination between, um, between the utility and the, the distortion. Okay, and this idea of this pessimism premium uh, then leads to the following definition. So if you have three rank dependent utility representations, uh, which are given by u, u1, u2, and w, w1, w2, then we call v pessimistic if and only if for any prospect with bounded support, the pessimism premium is positive. Okay, if it's negative, we call it optimistic. Okay, and, and we say that one is more pessimistic than the other, if and only if for any prospect with bounded support, the, the pessimism premium under the first one is larger than the pessimism premium uh, of the second one. Okay, and in the context of the very specific uh, distortion functions we have of this functional form corresponding to Wong, we have the following proposition. So in this case, if we have uh, three rank dependent utility representations with utility functions U1, U2, and U, and the distortion functions are all of this form of Wong, then uh, V is pessimistic if and only if the gamma is smaller than one. And V1 is more pessimistic than V2, if and only if the gamma correspond, so this, this is distortion parameter is smaller than than the distortion parameter of the rank dependent utility representation two. 
here we really have the following classification. We have pessimism, is gamma smaller one? We have objectivism, being objective, is gamma equal one? And we have optimism, is gamma larger one? And, and please keep this in mind when, when we later do a change of measure, because I think there is a nice, a nice interpretation there. Okay. Uh, also kind of as a corollary, we also obtain the optimal wealth process under and the optimal strategy if, if we have given this forward rank dependent performance criterion. Okay, and they basically look as follows. So uh, the optimal wealth process in the first case where we where we do have the this this functional form of Wong, then we have here the inverse marginal utility evaluated at the Lagrange multiplier times. Okay, here there's a normalization and then a power of the kernel. Okay, and the the, the strategy just looks looks as follows. So basically here you have the scaling through the distortion parameter. And the second case is what I promised before. So if you have the inequality, then it's just always optimal to invest zero. And then the wealth process is just constant. So the interest is really here. And here we basically we look at this wealth process and uh, what would we we saw is okay what what about we we change the measure such that this here becomes the pricing kernel in a new market and so if this is the pricing kernel in a new market then this is just a, the a classical uh, optimal wealth process corresponding to this utility function right or to this forward process right so that's the idea okay and and this is how we uh, define what we call the gamma distorted probability measure and so the definition is just that Okay, under this measure, the risk neutral measure will become what we want it to become. Okay. And and you apply you can apply here Kirsanov and, and you see how, how the price process evolves, and you find the following under this gamma distorted measure, right? The, under the gamma distorted measure, the price process is is just as before, but now this uh, market price of risk is scaled by the distortion factor. And then here I, I really like this idea of pessimism because if you think of of, of you have two different views basically one view is is rank dependent utility and there is this notion of pessimism and you know that the smaller the gamma the more pessimistic gamma smaller one you're pessimistic equal one you're objective larger one you're you're optimistic and here you have this alternative perspective of like being per perceivably in an alternative market where the market price of risk is scaled. And it's scaled by this distortion function gamma. So if you're pessimistic, you just believe kind of you're you're in a market where the market price of risk is smaller than it actually is. And if you're very optimistic, then you you perceive that you're in a market where the market price of risk is larger than it actually is. So this is I think is a nice is a it's a nice interpretation. Okay, and then. Uh, Applying, applying, uh, or in this market, right? Basically, we can just look at this auxiliary market where there's still a risk-free bond which, which doesn't have any interest, and in these end stocks which evolve according to to this SCE I just shown, um, we have a new pricing kernel which looks exactly as we want. That's how we defined. That's how we define a measure. And this market, we recall uh, these results on on time monotone forward performances. So. If you have a deterministic forward, it's always time monotone, meaning they're they're decreasing in time, and they are very well studied and they have a particularly nice structure. So basically, you can compose the time monotone, uh, you can compose the the spatial, the wealth part, and a time part, and a time part is here just um, uh, given by this the scaled factor here, and and these two are aggregated uh, through this function v. Which uh, solves here and 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 uh, the heat equation basically an inverse heat or a backwards heat equation, and this one has been studied basically through through Witter's theorem and and we know uh, if the, that if the initial solution is of the following form here, where mu is just a, a positive finite Borel measure, then we can solve it and and this is just really coming. Uh, all from the literature, so we know the so solution to this PDE is just uh, having the following form here. Okay. So the key message is here: not look too much at the math, but just we know how to solve the time monotone forward, and we know its structure if we have uh, initial utility of this of this particular form. Now we have basically the the second main theorem, 
which which just shows that what we've been doing uh, actually works. So this theorem is, is, is as follows, right? So it says, okay, uh, we have two directions. So the first one is you just choose this this distortion per meter gamma, which which reflects your view on the market. Then if you have a deterministic forward in the distorted market, and you just define the, the probability distortion according to how you know it must look like, then you eventually get a forward rank dependent performance in, in the original market. And conversely, if you start with a forward rank dependent in the original market, then there is a gamma, large, larger or equal zero. The, the equal zero part takes takes uh, uh, takes into account the the kind of uh, the general case where you don't invest, because it's larger or equal zero, such that you alone, if you forget about the distortion, is just a, a, this, a deterministic classical format in this distorted market. So you really have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the the forward rank dependent in the original market and the deterministic time monotone forward in the distorted market. Okay, and then we can just use this to actually construct uh, forward rank dependent performance criteria, right? So you can do this as follows. So first, you need to specify your degree of pessimism or optimism, okay? And then you need to pick an initial uh, utility function, an initial datum, which has the following form. So, you, but this is quite a it's quite a large class of, of utility functions here, right? okay? And then uh, you just need to find these functions that which which are sa satisfying. Uh, these equations that I've just shown you, so they look complicated, but we have them analytically. And then this pair here, uh, uh, which aggregates wealth and, and distorted time, and the distortion function is of the form of Wang, is the forward rank dependent performance criterion. So this, this shows you how you can uh, construct these, these processes. And we also find optimal wealth and optimal strategies. Um, these now, okay, just depend on these uh, ingredients which we get from from the time monotone forward. But here, everything is very explicit, right? so so there's no unknown quantity here. Basically, everything you you can you can get explicitly. And again, we have the two cases. So this is the case where gamma is, is larger zero, and then gamma equals zero. You just don't invest at all. I, I, we have some examples, but uh, since since time is running out, I go through this a bit quicker. So we, we can solve this for the, to the, the, the standard zero case, and we also solve it for the case where um, the this initial distribution is is a sum of two D rocks. And in these cases, we get everything uh, explicitly. Okay, and also the wealth and 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 um, the strategy we also get explicitly. Okay, so so to close here, I, I just want to very, very briefly um, also talk about the, the backward case and this dynamic utility approach. So this is a relatively recent approach, which is building on the observation that time consistency comes in part due to the fact that, uh, the in, that at an intermediate time, you're restricted to remain with the same uh, objective function modulus, modulus conditioning, right? And the idea is just to relax this and if, if you allow to vary more freely, maybe uh, you can regain time consistency. And so we want to we want to try this approach uh, for this particular problem of uh, rank dependent utility. And this is in particular motivated by this uh, working paper here, where they introduce the idea of a dynamic distortion. So what they do here is okay, we first look at a, a fixed ETO process, okay, which which is of the following form, and we start with a, a family. Of distortions, which which depend, which uh, just classify distortion from time s to t, and the idea in this paper is okay. They want they want to uh, find such a family, or, or sorry, you start with one which just goes from zero to t, and you want to find one which goes from s to t, such that you have a tower property for this process. Right? And so this is basically then what, what they call regaining to some degree time consistency. Okay, and they can do this in this paper for quite a general. Uh, class of initial distortion functions. Now, what is different in our setting is that the wealth process is not fixed, but it depends on the control, right? You you can choose it, and which one you choose depends on an optimality criterion. And what is optimal depends on on uh, this distortion uh, process itself. So it's not so clear that you can do the same. And indeed, we we show actually you can't, right? So in in many cases, we we cannot. Okay, but. 
uh, yeah, so this is basically the difference, right? So in, in their case, uh, the ETA process is fixed, but for optimization, you need to, you need to be able uh, to control it. And, and this is how we, uh, what motivates us to look at the following question. So we said, okay, let's start looking at a backward now. So we, we forget about the forward case for a moment. We look at a backward rack depend utility, which has given an initial utility function, given an in initial assertion function. And what we want to find is a family of utility. So now utilities also depend on the initial and the terminal time. The terminal time is now fixed. And a family of distortions, which depends on initial and terminal time such that the optimal strategy for the original problem is just optimal for any initial time. Right, so that, that, that is the idea. And the question is whether we can actually do this. And uh, the serum is saying basically, yes, you can, but only in two uh, special cases. And the special cases are on the one hand, okay, if the initial utility satisfied this inequality such that you never invest, well, then you can, then you just need to take uh, the utility at any time remaining such that you you satisfy this inequality and you keep not investing and then your time consistent. So, so this is not the interesting case. And the second case is is very similar to before, but the only difference, so you're still in, in this uh, class of Wong. So the initial utility, the initial distortion has to be of the class of Wong. Um, and then when the initial distortion is of the class of Wong, then you can basically define a dynamic distortion, which is of the class of Wong, which has a time varying distortion per meter. So this is now allowed to depend on on uh, the initial T, but it needs to be coordinated with the risk aversion of the utility part. So, so it is now allowed to time vary, but it needs to be coordinated uh, with with the, the risk aversion of the utility, in particular in a way that if basically the you become more risk averse then you should become less pessimistic. And so so if, if this one increases, this one must also increase such that because this one in here is, is, is constant. Right? So if, if this one increases, this one must also increase. OK, and um, yes, I think that's uh, that's basically what what I wanted to to talk about today. So. Uh, let me very quickly uh, re re recap here and conclude that we uh, introduce a new class of, of preferences, which are the forward rank dependent performance, and they allow for a framework where you have both utilities and rank and, and probability distortions evolving together uh, forward in time. Then we first establish this dichotomy for the distortion process. They're either degenerate and you never invest, or the marginal probability assertion equals to a normalized power of the quantile of the kernel. So this is what we called the Wong's distortion function. And then we looked at the, the structure of the optimal wealth process. This motivated a change of, of probability measure, and we could establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between the, the forward rank dependent in, in the original market and deterministic time monotone formats in this so-called distorted market. And then this basically allowed us to just build on, on previous results and, and actually construct uh, the forward rank dependent performances relatively explicitly in, in, in this case. And I did this a bit fast, but we are also able to basically uh, go back and revisit the backward case and look at this uh, dynamic distortion function and basically show that if you allow for optimization, uh, you can only do this for, for a very specific class of, of either degenerate distortion functions where you don't invest, or they have to be of this form uh, introduced by Wong. Okay, then I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm, of course, very happy to answer any questions.